basically, you know, we're picking up from where we left off on Tuesday, um, which was, I could not have timed that more perfectly. Like <laughs> we left off on like the worst, worst aspect of Hinduism for women. <laughs> so who wants to remind us uh, if you want to raise your hand, who wants to remind us where we left off on, on Tuesday? And so if we go back to that metaphysics picture and I had too much fun playing around with Canva yesterday, uh, I don't know if any of you saw the infographic I made. Uh, it's a little bit too much. I need to <laughs> like have it be less. So there's kind of a lot going on. But <clears throat> we have that picture. I can I can pull it up again if you'd like. Um, or do we have any questions about that metaphysical picture that we painted? Because it's rather complex and different from the sort of um, picture of reality we usually get in the West, right? We don't often think of the material world as being not real. <laughs> so any questions about that metaphysical picture? Okay, so <clears throat> given all of the components that are governing the realm that we exist on, which is Maya, right? So governed primarily by that cycle of birth, death, and rebirth, samsara, you're going to accumulate karma based on, right, the basic idea is that it's sort of a reaction or equalization of the kind of actions that you put out into the world, right? So the basic idea is that if you do good things, right, good things will come back to you in the next life, right? So that's the big difference between um, the actual doctrine of karma and the way most people think of it, right? It happens in the next life. It's not something that you're going to benefit from, you know, a few hours from now or a couple of years from now or anything like that, right? So we're not doing good things just so that we can reap the rewards right here and now, right? It's sort of a karmic bank, if you will, uh, for the next life. And so accumulating negative karma, right, means that you are going to be reborn in a worse position than you would be currently, right? And so you can be reborn, we didn't get to talk about this, but you can reborn, be reborn in multiple different forms in Hinduism and Buddhism, which we're going to see um, next week. But it's not just the human realm of rebirth that is possible. Does anyone know what else you could be reborn as in Hinduism? Sorry, that noise is my cat. I warned, I warned you. <laughs> yes, Hazel. Uh, animals? I feel like, I don't know why a beetle comes to mind, but I feel like that that isn't right. That's just the no, yes. instinctual. Good. So there's animals and insects, right? Oh. So we can distinguish between like levels of um, bio biological life in the animal realm as well. Good, good. So obviously, right, the hierarchy is clear. <laughs> being born as a human would be better than being born as an animal. Although, I don't know about you who have pets. I'm often jealous of my pets. But why, <laughs> why would it be better to be a human? <laughs> As, as awesome as our pets' lives seem sometimes. <laughs> Why would it be better? This goes back to the, the forces that rule over our soul. Remember, there's something that separates us from the plants and the animals or the insects. And so going back to that tripartite soul, right, that we get from the ancient Greeks, we get something similar, but a uh, different sort of conceptualization of it in Hinduism, right? We're focusing on the gunas, the forces that rule over the soul, right? And so we do have one of those that is sort of related to rationality, um, right? Which was what Plato focused on, but in the Hindu focus, it's understood in a broader sense as consciousness, right? Carly, like you're saying, right? So this more robust picture. Um, also, there's an element of harmony uh, in, in that notion of sattva as well. Um, and so this is the part of your soul, yes, Alina, that is the part of your soul that is united with Atman, right? That is immortal, okay? The other parts of your soul, the appetitive, the spirited, or in the Hindu terms, the rajas, the tamas, right? The passionate part of the soul, the just sort of ignorant, but, you know, survives part of the soul, right? Those two are not immortal, right? Those are temporary in Maya. And so we shed those parts of our soul after each life, right? So it's that sattva part that is going to be the most important. Yes, it ties us to Atman, ties us to Brahman, right? And it's that immortal part of the soul that is reborn. And so it carries that ka karmic load, if, it w uh, if you were, right? Like that, you know, backpack of points or whatever into the next life. And so, you know, being reborn into the human realm, though, obviously there's a great 
variety of circumstances, right, in which one can be born. And so that brings us to the idea that being born as a woman is somehow a sign that you have accumulated bad karma. And so I want to unpack this with you today. And we can, I would like to reference the reading, um, excuse me, that you had uh, from Vanita, the self is not gendered. So this is a story about a king and an ascetic who comes. And I want, I'm not going to tell, I want someone else to summarize the story for me. So I get a sense of where your understanding is. Um, but this is a really great sort of way to go through and unpack all of the, the stuff that's going on here. So um, let's start off with the story itself. Who read the story and feels comfortable summarizing the basic idea of it? So this is listed for today, Thursday. It's the first reading. So there's King Salaba. Who else? I'm going to give you a chance to look over this because I hear some more people joining us. So I'm going to update our attendance really quick. So feel free to take a look if you need to. If I can have a full screen of this and share my screen with you guys at the same time. But are you all able to pull it up on your own as well? Sorry, I was going to try and share it on my screen. Okay, so let's all open that document if we can. It's loading. <laughs> so there's uh, Salaba and King Janaka, right? So, um, this who wants to tell me about the king what what sort of impression do we have of him what kind of king is he is yes good right so she is already just so you know she's already in a very unique position just being in his presence on her own as an ascetic does anyone know what asceticism is and i'm gonna type the word chat or in oh sorry it's supposed to be ascetic with an s ascetic An ascetic is someone who goes without physical comfort, right? So they tend to, these tend to be um, more extreme levels of religious commitment, right? And so, right, the idea is that to achieve whatever the end goal is, in this case, enlightenment, right? One of the paths that is often, you know, heralded as being, um, you know, very valiant and, you know, difficult to do is to, right, go without constantly trying to make ourselves comfortable all the time, right? So not having excess clothing, not having excess food, not having shelter, right? So you'll see lots of people um, in India, especially, right, uh, obviously the birthplace of Hinduism, but around the world who they might look like, it, it, another way of thinking of it is taking a vow of poverty, right? So being committed to going without material possessions, right? You have just enough to survive. And the stuff that you do survive on is all you rely, it's called alms, right? These are all meant to be givings or offerings from other people, right? So you're not, um, you know, kind of having that material imprint on the world, which is supposed to be the reason that that's tied to enlightenment is because if the idea is to put out good karma, and you're not, you know, constantly just consuming all of the material things around you, right? it's almost very environmentalist, <laughs> if you think about it, right, then um, we're not putting like negative causation out into the world, right? So it's sort of like a way of like, nipping your causal influence in the bud a little bit, <laughs> right, by trying to not have as much of an impact. And so that in and of itself is seen as like a good thing, right? If you're not having any impact, well, at least you're not causing suffering, right? Which is the goal, right? We're trying to uh, get away from the suffering of Maya. That's that's the ultimate aim. So ascetics think that this is the path, right? Uh, to enlightenment. This is uh, one of many paths in Hinduism, right? To enlightenment, but a very common one that you see. And it is almost entirely 
practiced by men. Now, why would the ascetic tradition, Victoria, I see you nodding, but why would the ascetic tradition be dominated by men traditionally? Because except that typically that sort of authority as a guru comes after you've sort of proven yourself that you can be an ascetic. So why is it that that, that is mostly men first? Because you're right, right? It's mostly men here. And so mostly men have that sort of authority. And of course, we know people don't want to give up authority when they have it, right? Um, but in this case, there's something happening before they're even granted that sort of spiritual authority. Why are we not seeing, why is it odd that Salaba is an ascetic? And the king even talks about it. Okay, good, right? So we're already seeing that she he's judging her based on her appearance, which is ironic for him because in this scenario, he is the one claiming to be the enlightened one. Right. So that's his big claim to fame. He is the enlightened king. Um, I mean, meet a king that's humble. I dare you. <laughs> right? like any king is going to have the ego the size of their reign, I'm sure. <laughs> right. And so he very typical to his you know, status, thinks very highly of himself. And I'm sure very few, if anyone ever contradicts him, right, except for this woman <laughs> who comes in. And so, of course, he's judging her based on how he would judge anybody else, right? And in most people's experience, is it possible to be both beautiful and highly intelligent, which is something it's believed you need to attain enlightenment? Beauty and intelligence, could they possibly go together? Not historically, right? <laughs> women have not allow, been allowed to be both, <laughs> right? We we don't like to see women, we like to pinpoint them as one or the other, right? Um, kind of box you in in one shape or the other, which means that if you are one, you can't be the other, right? This sort of thing. Good. Um, I'm sure anyone who's, if, if anyone has found you attractive, they might automatically think you're less intelligent or just, again, based on the fact that you're a woman, right? I'm sure people have just under estimated your intelligence, right? Um, and so that sort of presumption, right, is very clearly at work here, right? Not Things have not changed that much. So Carly, I see your question, but Isabel, I wanted to give you a chance to chime in a little bit more before I go to Carly. Is there anything else you wanted to say? Which is, we would think the sign that someone is not enlightened, right? So he's really showing his his truth here. Good. Yeah. Carly. Good. Right. So there, there are a couple things going on here with the sort of oddity that she is, right. <laughs> As a woman who is an ascetic. So there are the ways in which there's sort of a double standard, right. For a man who takes on the ascetic role, right. He would be probably lauded and applauded, right. And celebrated for that kind of sacrifice. She's being criticized for it, right. Because she's being sexualized, right. And so the ascetic sort of lifestyle on her cannot be separated from the way in which he's already objectifying her as a woman, right? And so everything that he is seeing about her choices to be an ascetic or about her lifestyle is not in the context of spiritualism, right? Or dedication to, you know, one's faith. It's all in the context of her body, right? And so they're having this conversation really about what is what makes someone enlightened, right? And so she ends up, you know, in as much as he's demonstrating that he is not, <laughs> right, by the judgments that he's making, she very much demonstrates that she is in fact the more enlightened one, right? Because when we're talking about the Indian metaphysical picture here, right, she, why, why is gen, why is she saying that gender is not important here? What's her reasoning? Again, thinking back to that big metaphysical picture, who we are, our true selves. And this actually picks up on an important element of Hinduism that we're not talking too much about. Um, you noticed I, I only put part one of my Hinduism lecture in our uh, in our videos. That means there's a part two, which there is. It's on my YouTube channel. That gets into the Bhagavad Gita, which is a later text. But that text really does sort of break down the gunas more and ties it, you know, in more detail to the caste system. But what it does is it shows that no matter which part of the caste system you are at, there is a path to enlightenment for you. 
it just is appropriate to your skill set, <laughs> which is white, already presuming a lot, but presuming that one skills were dictated by the gunas that rule over your soul, right? And that that did place you in a certain area of society, right? The idea is that the people who are at the top, the Brahmins, those are not the only people who can achieve enlightenment. Even this ancient, the sacred texts say this, right? <laughs> that everyone has a path to enlightenment. They just, they go about it in different ways. Good. So that's what is, she's picking up on there. Yes, absolutely. Good. But what else? Why is she saying that? So gender doesn't matter because caste doesn't matter, right? Good. Why else doesn't gender matter, right? So if someone who is truly enlightened in Hinduism has overcome this is the one word we didn't throw up on the board yesterday, but I think I mentioned it. Avidya, right? So avidya is ignorance of our true self, right? So he is very clearly demonstrating by putting such an emphasis on her gender, right? He is demonstrating his own avidya, right? Which is the thing you have to overcome to be enlightened. So he is right again, demonstrating his lack of enlightenment, okay? And so she is showing that by not placing an emphasis on gender, she has uncovered her true self, right? Or Atman, right? And Atman as part of Brahman is genderless, right? There is no gender tied to that. Like you said, gender, everything tied to our physical body is all part of that temporary realm of Maya. All right, so that's the main sort of takeaway about this sort of inherent, we have a potential contradiction here, right? A sort of, and this is something that we're going to, you're probably going to get one or two or maybe multiple major, you know, issues like this in each religion that we look at, right? So this is the big one for Hinduism. How do we reconcile a genderless Atman <laughs> with this highly segregated caste system? Right. And so one way to do that is to go back to what we were saying at the beginning of the course. Right. And go back to our history lessons and look at when this sort of emerged right from the tradition. And it doesn't emerge until someone asked about this the other day in class. And I was so glad that they did until this text came out. <laughs> Who wants to tell us about the laws of Manu? <laughs> Right, so we have the Vedas, the Upanishads, then we get the Bhagavad Gita, the laws of men who come later. So they're not even like part of the original three, you know? But it's a very important text, shaped a lot of current culture. Exactly right. And the rules are going to be very gendered, obviously. So does anyone know what was going on at the time that this text came out in India? British colonialism. Okay, so this is something that, honestly, they probably should write a paper, but someone should do a study on it. But it seems to me, <laughs> given the studies that I have done over the years, there seems to be a common pattern when we look at these traditions, right? Because we talked about how at the beginning, if you go back far enough, you can find that women were in a very elevated position, right? In every tradition, right? We had this ancient goddess worship, right? Um, seemed maybe more egalitarian than what women were allowed to do out in society, right? And then something happens and this sort of regulation or system is put in place. And what that event seems to be is always an invasion of an outside force, okay? So we have someone coming in and so what happens is you have a crisis, right? A crisis of power. And so individuals who once felt that they had power now feel like it's being taken away from them, which it honestly historically has been, right? When we're talking about colonialism. And so what we have is this, you know, we didn't have this term until recently. It's a psychological phenomenon called punching down. Has anyone ever heard of this? Okay, so punching down is the the phenomena of really only taking out our anger and frustration on people we feel safe doing so with, right? So the idea is that if you 
are expressing your anger towards someone, it's because <laughs> you feel safe enough to do so, which typically means that you are in an equal to or higher position of power than that person, right? And so what happens is you feel safe taking your anger out on them and usually frustration on them because you can't take it out on the end of the party above you, right? And so, so you've seen probably, I think the most common depiction of this is like, you know, maybe a, a really depressed, you know, middle-aged white housewife, you know, who's not fulfilled in her own life. And so she takes it out on her housekeeper or something, right? <laughs> Instead of, you know, the people, you know, she's, she's taking it out in the place where she feels powerful, right? In the space where she feels she can do so without the consequences, right? And so it's not unreasonable to think that men do the same thing, right? So if you have a situation where they're was typically a certain group in power and that power is being taken away from them, they're going to punch down. And where are they going to punch down? And the only place they can is at home, right? When we're talking about colonial imperialism, right? And so that seems to be the case. And if you look at the laws of Manu, were basically a way of infiltrating Indian society with the British rules, right? The Victorian era <laughs> regulations about how men and women should interact with each other, right? And so this is one of the things we have to consider, right? When unpacking traditions and looking at the problems, right? What, when did this text emerge? What was going on when it emerged? What were the motivations behind it, right? And is it deeply connected with the origins of that tradition? Is it even consistent with the origins of that tradition? And it seems like in this case, pretty clearly, not so much, <laughs> right? But yeah, if you want to look at some fun rules <laughs> that you might have been governed by, <laughs> take a look at some of those. Yeah, good. Okay, um, so good. We still have plenty of time left. So I'm just going to open it up now to general questions. Any We've covered the big stuff. Any questions uh, about Hinduism, about we, you know, we only talked about women in Hinduism, but obviously anyone outside of the binary is going to be marginalized. So there are, you know, more contemporary trans issues or non-binary issues, right? Lots of things to unpack. So uh, I'm just going to leave the rest of the class open to our questions. So feel free to raise your hand and you type your question in the chat, whatever you're most comfortable with. So so I'm so glad you brought that example because, um, yeah, and it's, yeah, so we talked about this a little bit when we talked about indigenous traditions, right? So having third gender um, being uh, uh, double uh, double spirit, two spirit, sorry, <laughs> double spirit, sorry, two spirit, right, is what it's often called in the indigenous traditions. But we have variations of this in a lot of cultures, right? And yes, like you're saying, and similarly, at one point, right, being able to tap into both masculine and feminine energies, right? Like that is pretty clearly, you know, if both sides have their certain strengths, someone who's able to tap into both would be considered to be even more powerful or more can have more capacities in some respect, right? Yeah. And so the Hydra too were given this sort of historical, you know, special status. Um, but that has changed. Um, and this, again, you know, one could ask, like, does the influence of Western binary gender, you know, over time have anything to do with cultures no longer being accepting of third or additional identities, right? So, you know, I, we'd have to go back and, and look more, right, at the history of, of exactly when the turn happened. But you're right that they are today, even though, you know, they, they exist still, luckily, right? They, they're able to exist, at least in, in some spaces, they are treated very differently. Um, I actually had uh, an experience that was fascinating uh, when I went to Bali, um, which is in Indonesia, and it's the only Hindu island in in that series of islands. Um, the rest are Muslim. And so I had the chance to go to a wedding while I was there, and their entertainment was a hitra. She came and she danced. And the sort of thing that you would do is like she would you know pull people up from the audience and dance with them and so it was like funny when she would pull up the old men right because they're dancing with 
a man who's dressed like so you could tell that her presence was always was like intentionally mocking the heteronormative status in a way and I noticed that the men would get very rough with her like you know she, you know women were dancing with her and chilling it's very fun and you know not touching and the men were very aggressive and I noticed right after she was done she she left and she left with an escort and I just found that to I had I've never seen anything like that uh with a performer um and so yeah that just if you want a little anecdote of <laughs> of how you know she's obviously making a living in any way she can but she it, she didn't seem like she felt that safe to me in that space yeah good okay yes victoria when it comes to nirguna brahmin versus saguna brahmin good so does hinduism try to address nirguna or solely focus on saguna so this excuse me, if we recall, is the one of the ways, one of the many ways of breaking apart Brahman, right? Brahman is this infinite thing that we cannot comprehend. And so one way of at least talk, trying to talk about Brahman or starting to have that conversation is to acknowledge that there are parts of Brahman that can be discussed and parts of Brahman that cannot be discussed, right? And so yes, the idea is focus on the parts that can be discussed, right? And of those parts, right, we've identified Atman, one of the other um, common threads that you will get is um, the trimurti. I think it's chat, a chat. Okay, so these are seen as the primary facets or activities that Brahman engages in in the material world. And so um, these are Vishnu, Shiva, and Brahma. You'll notice a lot of variations. There's Brahman. There's Brahma, there are the Brahmins at the top of the cast, <laughs> all different, <laughs> all spelled a little differently. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So Vishnu, Shiva, and Brahma are the three primary, again, activities that Brahman is said to engage in. This is, again, focusing on the cycle, ties to the cycle of samsara. So we have that creation, right? That initial creation, birth. We have the change, right? that things undergo, and then we have their destruction as well, right? So we have these various elements. And there are also, also a feminine version of the Trimurti, which I think it's called Tri-Shiva. No, Shiva might be one of them. Uh, sorry, Shiva is one of the Trimurti. Tri-Devi. Devi is the word for a female goddess, right? So we have the Trimurti and then we have the Tridevi, but the Tridevi are seen as the three males partners, like they each have a mate. So again, we get that heteronormative matching or pairing. It yeah, seems like, does to that have to be that they're pairing. It's from um, some, the, the other sacred texts, right? So we have uh, the Vedas, the end of which is the Upanishads. We have the Bhagavad Gita, which is an epic poem. It's really beautiful, actually. Um, I would encourage you to read it sometime. Uh, but it's part of the longest epic poem ever written, which is called the Mahabharata. And the other part of the Mahabharata is the um, Sadhayamika, which has the ultimate coupling, <laughs> right, between a man and woman. And so every woman is supposed to emulate the female and every man is supposed to emulate the male. And so we get that sort of mirroring in the polytheistic, um, uh, the sort of pantheon of gods, right, that we see in Hinduism. We tend to see that same idea that you have to have one to one. Now, why why do you think that is? Again, we we talked a little bit about this, but we can maybe work to go into it a little bit more. But um, what else did you learn about this week in the readings where you need something from the masculine and something from the feminine? You need both. I remember, I think I gave you a hint that it's, they're going to use the field and the seed metaphor. <laughs> Does anyone remember this word? It was when I was introducing metaphysics, right? We have stories about the beginning. Anyone remember what those are called? Isabel, right? So this ties back to Indian co cosmogenies, right? So the story of creation in Hinduism, 
right? Used to be just described as like one human being, right? Sort of creating the universe. But we get this cosmogony that ends up, this metaphor in the texts in Hinduism that end up being taken more seriously, which is that the universe was created by a seed, right? Entering the field, which again, the part of that contains life is contained in which component, the field or the seed? <laughs> you were gonna say the field? Yeah. Logical, right? This is a this is a mystical field <laughs> where there's no life yet, right? And so yeah, Carly, you're right. The the life-giving forces are contained in the seed. And people thought this for a long time about human fertilization too, right? They thought that you got the source of life from the male, right? From the sperm. And so women's reproductive powers for as much as, you know, that is at least some power that women have been <laughs> acknowledged to have. Um, it's always been portrayed in this very passive way, right? As if women are just the receptacles, the containers of life, right? We are not the giver. We don't bring the life, right? We merely provide the nurturing circumstances <laughs> needed for that life to prosper, right? So again, these things, these things are not by accident, right? When we find that a man must, or a woman must always have a man, right? There's usually a reason behind this type of thinking, right? And for this tradition, it goes back to the very beginning of creation, because if that is how Brahman, right, intended things to be, then that, then who are we to mess with that, right? <laughs> All right. Other questions. Uh, I, I think, you know, throughout history, we can say that people are very often inspired from one another, right? <laughs> very rarely is it the case that, you know, someone has an idea at one point, you know, thousands of years into human history, and no one had that idea before them, like, <laughs> right? Um, and so, yeah, like I mentioned, Alexander the Great can be, um, you know, attributed with the influence of Platonic philosophy. But given that a lot of religions take shape and form in places that might already be worshiping certain gods i would have to know more about when the durga first was created i don't know like how old she in particular is as a goddess like when she first started to emerge on the scene um and then we'd have to compare that right to the greek or roman versions and do a little historical digging, but it sounds fascinating. I'd be curious to know. Um, I just wanted to mention an Alina's point here in the chat. Uh, Sati, thank you. That's who I was talking about <laughs> as the um, ideal woman, right? And so here you're saying that she is connected in, or she's being blamed um, for her husband's death because of her past life, right? So yes, women being blamed for a lot of things that go on, right? If that's, if these are the couples that we're supposed to emulate and, right, you see um, responsibilities being delegated, you know, distributed differently, right? And again, this is not too dissimilar to how, right, women are held to very different standards today in public spheres, right? Who has to take responsibility for what, uh, what counts as, you know, enough to make someone a bad person it seems to take a lot less to make a woman a bad person than it does to make a man a bad person and, you know, public opinion. So, right, sim same sort of ideas, right? Who who are we actually punishing? Who's being held accountable for things? Who actually has the power to make change, right? Good, good, good. Um, I saw a hand. Victoria, was it? So what's interesting is that the four books in the Vedas are divided up thematically, right? And so we could definitely look at whether or not there are analogous, you know, structures in other sacred texts. And that would certainly be interesting. There's already so much to say about how the Bible has been constructed and reconstructed over time, right? So you guys know there are different versions of the Bible, right? <laughs> and so different versions are going to have different content, they're going to emphasize different things, right? So there are all those issues <laughs> that, that have to be dealt with. Um, but the Trimurti and the Holy Trinity is an obviously, like, like those two are so, so similar. And it's especially important because obviously not only did Hinduism emerge far earlier than Christianity did, but the Holy Trinity did not even enter into Christianity until much later in the tradition, right? It was not something that was present from the beginning, Right. Um, and so it's very clear that the philosophers and theologians 
who put forth the Holy Trinity definitely would have known about the Trimurti, right? Um, given their educational backgrounds. Like I, I'm being charitable here. I, I'm assuming that they were smart enough to have, or educated enough to have been informed about them. <laughs> um, I could be wrong, but uh, you're definitely gonna see that three number show up a lot. If you're like into numerology, I'm sure there's something there, but it's always three, three of everything. <laughs> So this and tying it back to Sati, right? So we have to talk about this issue of dowries as well, right? So the idea Definitely. that when, right? So we have obviously the heteronormative institution of marriage that's gonna be connected to the caste system where historically you could only mem marry members of the same caste as you, but it's on the female's family to provide the dowry, right? And so does anyone know what happens when uh, a fam their family is not able to pay the dowry? She gets murdered, oh. right? And yeah, because typically they're already married, right? Usually dowries are like, you know, not everyone has like the full lump sum. And so if they're not able to complete the payments of the dowry, she will be murdered. It's called a dowry death. They happen in public all the time by members of sometimes the women's own family. Sometimes member uh, members of the husband's family so that he can be free to remarry. Free her. him up. Yeah, because otherwise she's considered a burden, right? Now you are another mouth to feed and you've not provided, right? And so she is considered a burden. And so the only way to free up the husband to make another, uh, you know, smart match or beneficial, fruitful match is to kill her because there is no divorce, right? To free him up to marry again. Um, and the other element of that is that after a husband dies, right, the element of sati comes in because, and sati is just for those of us who aren't clear, it's the practice of a widow throwing herself on the funeral pyre of her husband, right? So her husband has passed and she is expected to throw herself on the fire so as not to be a burden to anyone else in her family, right? Which is why the largest number of impover impoverished people in India, not the ascetics, <laughs> they're widows, right? Because no, they don't have a man to take care of them anymore. And it's not necessarily expected that their sons should do so, right? Because they're seen as having their own families to take care of. So, oh God, another happy note to end on. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, dowry deaths are still probably that as well as just sexual assaults, right, is still a really, really big problem in these types of cultures. And it's a lot of it has to do with the fact that they don't allow young people to socialize and interact with each other, right? So men don't know how to be around women. Women don't, right, there, there's no safe spaces for them to socialize because there's no dating, right? <laughs> or if there is, it's all arranged or, um, uh, you know, you have the chaperone <laughs> it's like supervisor is not the right word chaperone right uh watching so right there's there's a lot of issues that are still prevalent today um that you might see on the news a lot right um that are still going to be tied tied to these very ancient teachings all right so uh next week we're going to be moving into buddhism because buddhism began in india actually sprung out of hinduism so know the story of, get to know the story of the Buddha, the Siddhartha Gautama a little bit, right? We'll talk about uh, intro to Buddhism next week. Um, so again, we kind of uh, did some of the metaphysics. So in that infographic, I kind of included the Buddhism side because they're only going to take that Maya portion. They're not going to take everything above it. So no Atman, no Brahman. So we're going to have to re-understand some of those elements of Maya. So we're going to have some new terminology, right? Different ways of conceiving those elements of Maya if there is no true self. All right. So we'll talk about that next week, but I hope you all have a warm and safe weekend. And feel, uh, please feel free to email me if you have any questions about anything. I can all also uh, hang out a few minutes if anyone has any questions. Yes. If you have notes, save them, save them, save them. I will get to you next week. Thanks, y'all. <laughs>